We want to call our evening session of our convention to order. And we're pleased to have the secretary here. Only he and a few of us know how close and how hard he tried and how close he come not to making this appointment. The airplane door nearly closed with him on the outside and with persistence he was able to get in. And he expressed tonight that his determination to come and meet here. And after a person has traveled and spoke and been used in many, many instances to accomplish certain goals, it's much easier to look for a little haven and get a little rest. But we appreciate him making that last effort. And I want to give you a little background on the secretary. He was born in Galesburg, Illinois, and there he operated the block farms. It's a family type farm there, so he has firsthand knowledge into the activities and the concerns that you and I have as farmers and ranchers. A working farmer, he knows the importance of receiving cost of production. He graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point in 1957. He's been the Director of Agriculture in the state of Illinois since 1977. The Secretary was appointed in January to the President's Cabinet. President Reagan chose him, and as you know, about this time a year ago, our recommendation was that he be the choice of the candidates that were presented for review. So we're happy to have him here, and he's a physical advocate. He becomes involved in what marathon races he can, and perhaps that physical fitness is going to help him on this battle with the Farm Bill. You have to be in good condition to take that battle. And so, Mr. Secretary, we invite you to address this convention body, and we welcome you here tonight. Secretary Block. Thank you very much, Mr. President. This is a super crowd, and I'm so glad to see you. You can't imagine. I, I, I think you're glad to see me, but I'm really glad to see you because uh, everything uh, seemed to kind of fall to pieces today, and uh, we got heavy into the farm bill, and I spent about three hours with the leadership of the House and Senate Ag Committees and the conference committees working on this bill, and uh, about 20 to 6, I said, listen, you know, I've got another engagement. I've just got to leave. And, uh, and uh, in effect, we probably got more work done in the next 10 minutes than we'd gotten the whole afternoon. <laughs> and uh, But then I left. I can't predict that we have a solution to it, but we're working on it, and we're making some progress, and it isn't easy. I'll tell you, you know as I know it isn't easy uh, with the times we have today. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit as I visit with you here tonight. Uh, I want to say, before I really get into some of my remarks, that I want to compliment this organization for their leadership in collective bargaining. You've been the leader in this area and forged a path ahead. I want to say that how much I appreciate the endorsement of your president last year as Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, I want you to know it didn't go unnoticed, I'll tell you that. And, I wish I had a magic wand and I could solve all of our problems in agriculture because I live with them on a daily basis. I live and die agriculture as I have all my life. And uh, I've got a father at home on the farm and he's still active. My son's graduated from college and he's back on the farm. I guess I'm the only generation not working, more or less. <laughs> And I get back to the corner coffee shop just like you do, and I know what people are talking about. They're talking about interest rates and inflation and prices. 
and uh, you know we're all in this thing together and the governor the government is really not going to deliver us single-handedly from our problems we can only help like I said if I could with a magic wand solve our problems I would but it's going to take more than that we've got problems throughout the economy but I think we're starting to do something about them and what is happening is that we have a quiet revolution going on in this country since President Reagan came to office and you're the people that helped to elect him along with people all over this land there have been some sweeping changes in the money being spent to fund a bloated bureaucracy we're cutting that back the money being taken away from the taxpayers we're reducing that the people know better how to spend this money certainly than the government does a lot of people might not have anticipated even when they voted for President Reagan that when he got there in the White House that he would proceed to do what he said he would do and I'll tell you he has proceeded to do what he said he would do there's a country western song and I'm a great lover of country music and it's sung by Merle Haggard and part of the song talks about when a president walks through the White House door and does what he says he'll do we'll all be drinking free bubble up and eating rainbow stew well that's the way it goes and uh, if that's the case I, just, I don't know but you probably had bubble up and rainbow stew for supper because we do have a presence that's doing what he said he'll do he's in here with both feet and we are working to turn this country around after some 30 years of big government and government growth we're working to cut budgets cut taxes and reduce regulations that are oppressive on the working men and women of this land like the ones that we have here and I'll cover a few things that have happened that have been done since I've been there mostly those that would focus on agriculture which is where our principal interest is first of all we lifted a Soviet grain embargo that I think was an enormous mistake it cost us markets it cost us income and it's still costing us but we've taken it off but we're moving in the right direction now not only have we lifted it we've negotiated a one-year extension of our grains agreement we've offered the Soviet Union an additional 15 million metric tons above the 8 million metric tons that is included in the agreement they've already taken more than the 8 and are starting to move into the additional 15 and they're up around a little over 10 million now and if you look at the whole world for the most part we have pretty good crops around this world that's one of our problems but the one place they don't have very good crops is the Soviet Union now, I don't know where you think we'd be if we didn't have that embargo off because that we would really be in trouble we the system is we need a demand for our product we need a market and so we're going after that market along with any other markets we can find we've taken the lid off of commodity prices in this administration in the past commodities would reach a trigger level and at that time the loans on the farmer held grain reserves would be called farmers would be obligated to pay off their loans and you know when you get that call you're probably going to take your grain and sell it to pay off the loan you're probably not going to go to the bank and borrow the money and this has served as an effective lid on prices I don't believe in having a lid on prices they need to have a chance to run and go higher we absolutely must have some good times to heal the wounds of the low prices and the bad times so that it can average out <laughs> and 
and I have to admit that I cannot predict when those good times may come. But I've farmed for a lifetime and lived on a farm for a lifetime. And when it looks the worst, that's when it gets better. When it looks the best, that's when it gets bad. Uh, like, uh, like an old gentleman always told me, it's kind of like uh, when you're sick, you think you'll never get well. When you're well, you think you'll never get sick. It's about the way it works. So in spite of the fact that the United States Department of Agriculture, my own statisticians, prognosticators, predict income in agriculture next year no better than this year, I hold out hope, uh, hope uh, based upon the fact, the fact that those same prognosticators traditionally have never come within 20 percent of being right, always off six billion dollars or more. And they've got to be off on the low side this time. <laughs> so we'll wait and see. This department's launched an aggressive export program to find markets in other countries, pinpointing countries and traveling to them with teams to try and open up those markets. And it's been at a time when it's been difficult because of the high interest rates and the value of the dollar being strong, and it's made us less competitive internationally. But we're still pushing that route, and we're going to keep it up. We've been aggressive in challenging the European community, community subsidizing their exports. That isn't right. They're subsidizing their exports and taking markets away from our farmers. And we're challenging them on that. I'll be in Brussels a little over a week from now to meet with the president of the European community and some of the ministers. And I'll have with me, or they'll have me with them, however you want to put it. We'll be together. We'll have the Secretary of State, Al Haig. We'll have our trade ambassador, Bill Brock. And united we are on this issue because we need to have even-handed trade around this world. We need to have free access to markets, and we need to have fair competition. This administration has cut the tax rate on individuals. It needed to be done. In, in one area in particular, in farm machinery and livestock, it can be written off over five years and still qualify for the 10-year investment credit, the full investment credit. And I went into a cabinet meeting one day, and seated on my left right beside me is Secretary of the Treasury, Regan, Don Regan. And one of the first things that he said to me that day, which really shows that, you know, we're not always dealing up here on the high stratosphere, we get right down to where things really are sometimes. And he said, you'll be happy to know that uh, as we've been hammering out some of the issues on taxes and uh, the new tra tax strategy, that in accordance which, uh, with what I'd been saying and you out there have been saying, everyone, that we've concluded that we will have this full investment credit and we'll have a five-year write-off. And furthermore, that means on single purpose structures, they can be written off, and that in particular means that hog barns can be written off and uh, can be uh, uh, eligible for full investment credit. Now, if there are any hog farmers out there, and I know there are, you know that we have been fighting with Internal Revenue Service for a long time, trying to get them to understand that hog barns should qualify for full investment credit. Well, it's done now, and it's going to happen. It's, it's not the whole solution, but it'll help. The President has rewritten the inheritance tax laws. And I know that I've been to farmer meetings for a lifetime, 
and we've always talked about the confiscatory system we had of, of inheritance taxes which takes a family farm away and ends up giving a substantial part of it to the government. No more. That's not going to be the case. This farm can pass on to the spouse at no charge at all and then on to the children with a $600,000 exemption. And it'll be an enormous help for us. And it's about time it happened. The president felt so strong about this as he went on his campaign trail, wherever he went. They would, you know, they always write speeches for you. And I think we're all a lot the same. We use some of them, and some of them we don't care that much about, we don't use, and then we add something to it because it fits in our own minds. The president always added in his speeches that it's time we got this inheritance tax off the back of the hard-working people and the family people that want to keep this property in the family. And he, he carried through on that promise as he's carried through on many of his others. We took the strikers from the food stamp rolls, and that needed to be done. You've got to have incentive to work in this country. And we're asking the affluent children to pay a little bit more for that school lunch, and I think that's only right. I think we want to turn more of these school responsibilities back to the local communities, to local school boards. The federal government shouldn't be dictating everything to the local districts on how to do it, how much the portion size should be, and all the details, down to the last dotted I. Turn it back to the people where our children are. We restored Cooperative Research and Extension Service to an agency status. And it had been downgraded before, but Cooperative Research and Extension, Agricultural Research, is the next area that we have given attention to. We've re-emphasized agricultural research, not only production research, but utilization research, to utilize the products that we produce. We intend to get inflation under control, and like I've pointed out, interest rates have come down, not nearly enough, we know that. The inflation has come down. We're making progress. And officially, the President's plan has only been in effect since October 1, about 40 days take a little while for it to get the job done. We do intend to continue to keep cutting government spending and government waste. We intend to continue to reduce the burden of regulation on agriculture as well as other industries. We're going to abolish the Department of Education and the Department of Energy. I think I think your local school districts can, and your states can better manage this education than to think that we should try and heavy-handedly make all these decisions in Washington, D.C. We've introduced a comprehensive soil and water conservation program. This is an area that I'm, I am deeply concerned about as we intensively farm the land, the most precious resource we have in this country at the same time got an obligation to that land and to future generations. We think we've introduced a plan that can, that can be helpful. And I know that farmers are responsive to good plans. The farmer is the original conservationist. And we want to work to solve this problem. And finally, First of all, I intend to speak out for agriculture in this administration, and wherever I go, I will be forever an evangelist for agriculture and the contribution it makes, the contribution it makes to the people of this country and around the world. And I got, as my leader, a president, he, he really believes he's a farmer, and he is. He's a farmer rancher. You talk with him, and he's, he'll tell you about the tractor that he 
within months that he priced uh, about buying a little end loader tractor on his uh, ranch. Typical story, I'll tell you something. Uh, the, uh, they told him that it's an old tractor, I think it's 59, but they, he was amazed. They said they'd offer him $4,000 for it. And then he could have a new tractor if he'd throw in $16,000. <laughs> I've heard that story so many times. It's the same one. So when he told me that story, I knew he was pretty close to the farm because you wouldn't hear it unless you knew something about it. I've told you about a few things that we've done, and there are some things that, we, that are important that we intend to do. Furthermore, there are some things that we haven't done, and perhaps they're as important or more important than some of the things we have done. We do not intend to do anything that the American public is capable of doing for itself. We're going to be more responsible as we do the things that government is responsible for. That means that we do not intend to tell people what to eat unless the research behind our actions is conclusive. It means that we do not intend to single out farm commodities for export embargoes. We do not intend to do anything that will throw unnecessary roadblocks in our way as we carry on our responsibilities. And we will not be a party to any effort of the federal government trying to hold down farm prices. And I think that's important. That is part of this this, uh, the situation we're in. We have low prices. It's true, they're intolerable. But when they turn around, we have to have a chance for them to go up so that we can have some good times to balance it off. And I've seen it, administrations, as you have, that have moved to hold them down with export embargoes and other actions. President Reagan will not do that. We're going to give the free economy a chance to work. He believes in it. It's going to function. And it's going to function to our benefit before it's over. Wait and see. I'd like to end by saying just a few words about the responsibilities of the private sector. That, that's us. That's you. That's the people that do the work in this land. It's kind of human nature to be cautious we're talking about change. We're changing some things in this country. We've talked about creating changes in government for years. I've been to farmer meetings and we've talked about uh, cutting estate taxes. We've uh, talked about uh, all, many of these things, cutting taxes, cutting government spending, and it never happened. You know, it just never happened. You'd go home and the next thing you knew, the budget was bigger, there was growth here, there was a new program, new regulations imposed upon the people, and you'd get to feel a little bit helpless after a while. Well, it's happening now. That's the amazing thing. This is change. And some people are surprised by it. Some people are cautious because of it. Some people wonder what's going to happen because we are doing it. Caution is understandable, but we must not let it stand in the way of completing the changes, the new changes, the additional changes that have to be made. President Reagan is just in the middle of doing what he was elected to do. We need your support to help us on the federal level, 
We need your support and effort on the local level. The president campaigned on the promise that he was going to let the private sector do the things that government should not be doing. The private sector and the people in the local community should be caring for the people. This is an enormous shift in responsibility to us, to the states, to the counties. If the private sector does not accept this responsibility, the private citizens, then the only alternative will be to return to the way things were. And if that happens, the proponents of big government will have ammunition to make government even bigger, even more powerful. And the responsibility that was once offered to us may never again be available. We've got it in our hand now. Let's not turn loose of it. I don't want to wake up and have it turn back the hands of time to where we were. And I ask you to not let the president down. Help us. And if you do, you'll be helping yourselves. You won't be letting yourselves down either. Thank you. All of us.